So today's uh, case presentation is on fundus autofluorescence cases. Uh, I'll be uh, describing, uh, talking about fundus autofluorescence uh, in retinal detachment cases today. So what is the principle? Basically, fluorophores are molecules uh, which when excited by light of a particular wavelength, uh, they emit light of uh, the higher wavelength. The signal which comes uh, in an autofluorescence image is basically from the retinal pigment epithelium and the photoreceptor complex. Uh, there are two components. First is the fluorophore, which is uh, mainly uh, the lipofusion in the lysosomal bodies of the RP cells. And the second one is the photopigments of the outer uh, photoreceptor segments, which act as a filter. Uh, the imaging systems for autofluorescence imaging are of three types. First is the flash-based. Second is the uh, CSLO, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. And uh, we also have the wide field uh, imaging. Uh, the difference between the flash-based and the CSLO is that uh, uh, the flash-based image uh, is of a lower contrast. Also, the field of view is 50 degrees, while uh, in the CSLO, the image contrast is better. Uh, the field is, uh, we can get 30 degrees and 55 degrees view. Uh, wide field covers almost 200 degrees. And uh, well, this is better for peripheral manifestations in diseases, retinal diseases. Uh, these are the uh, machines which uh, we have uh, we had uh, over here. Uh, so before moving on to the cases, uh, the autofluorescence patterns which we usually see, uh, the increased autofluorescence and decreased autofluorescence. Increased is seen when there is reduced clearance of the lipofusion by RPE, increased turnover of the photoreceptor outer segments, uh, and in window defects. Decreased autofluorescence is mainly see, uh, seen when there is RP inactivity or loss, uh, reduced turnover of photoreceptor outer segments, or any defect or uh, blocking the signal, uh, autofluorescence signal. Uh, now, we'll see uh, patterns in retinal detachment, uh, autofluorescence patterns in retinal detachment pre and post repair, and try to understand the pathophysiology behind them. Uh, the first case it was a 21 year old female uh, bl came with blurring of vision in the right eye since seven months. Uh, the best corrected visual acuity was uh, 624. Here we can see the uh, patient has a, a chronic RD. We can see a demarcation line on the color photo and uh, we can see some subretinal glyosis over here. Uh, the autofluorescence image again showed the demarcation line, which uh, had hypo autofluorescent, uh, clear hypo autofluorescent spots, and uh, the subretinal glyosis. Also, here we can see uh, the attached and the detached retina. Uh, we can see the demarcation between the two uh, because of this autofluorescence findings. Now, why is there a demarcation line? When there is presence of SRF for a prolonged time, uh, it leads to RPE or photoreceptor death. Uh, because of the loss of their interaction. Uh, there is basically RP fibrous metaplasia, which gives us some hypoautofluorescence. The clinical implication is that uh, the location of the hypoautofluorescence, uh, after getting to know the location of this demarcation line, we can actually, uh, uh, we know what the prognosis of the retinal detachment might be. Like if it crosses the macula or the fovea, we know that uh, there is a there is going to be a guarded guarded prognosis in these cases. Uh, the second case, uh, it is a 55 year old male, uh, diminution of vision since 20 days, the right eye. Uh, the best corrected visual acuity was 660. This patient has an uh, uh, had a, a fresh retinal detachment from the 11 o'clock position to the 4 o'clock position uh, with a hole in the uh, temporal periphery, superior temporal periphery. Uh, the patient underwent scleral buckle, uh, scleral buckling surgery. Here is the post operative three month uh, autofluorescence image of this patient. The best erected visual acuity at this time was 6 9. Here we can see a clear distinction between the attached and the detached retina. Uh, also, we can see certain hyper autofluorescent lines, which were correlated on OCT with the uh, SRF pockets, which are lined by elongated photoreceptor cells. Now, uh, the differentials of uh, there are certain uh, autofluorescent patterns which are seen post retinal detachment repair. The differentials for them are the first one are the outer retinal folds. These are again, these can be hypo or hyper autofluorescent uh, lines seen, seen after retinal detachment repair. 
correlated on OCT. They are basically folded inner segment, outer segment of the photoreceptor band and the uh, external limiting membrane. These are initially hypoautofluorescent. Later, they turn into hyperautofluorescent uh, hyper uh, lines and later they resolve in uh, due course of time. Uh, the second one, the second differential is a retinal vessel printing, which are lines of increased autofluorescence, which can be seen parallel to the retinal vessels. These were first seen uh, by Shiragami et al. Uh, in 2010. Uh, the, sec uh, the third case, the third case, we have a 31 year old male uh, with uh, diminution of vision in the right, uh, which uh, in the right eye since uh, which he noticed uh, 10 days back. Uh, he had a history of trauma five years back with a best corrected visual acuity of 6-9. You can see he has an uh, uh, right eye inferior temporal uh, retinal detachment bisecting the macula. The autofluorescence imaging again confirmed the same finding. He again had a demarcation line which suggested that it was a chronic uh, retinal detachment. Also, he had a posterior hyperautofluorescent margin. This patient underwent scleral buckle surgery. Uh, autofluorescence imaging was done uh, postoperatively at six weeks. Uh, his visual acuity was six nine. Here we can see a hypo autofluorescent uh, patch uh, below the macula, which correlated on the OCT as again SRF uh, subretinal fluid, again lined by elongated photoreceptor cells. Uh, this again at post op two and a half months. This hypoautofluorescent patch turned into hyperautofluorescence. The only difference in the OCT is that the height of the SRF is decreased. Now, this phenomenon can be actually explained uh, by uh, the hypothesis that initially early post-op phases, we see hypoautofluorescence uh, uh, in the SRF and at the time of resolution, there is hyperautofluorescence. The hypothesis, there are two hypotheses to this. Uh, there is basically uh, increased RP metabolism because of photoreceptor uh, outer segment uh, as the uh, retina uh, as the SRF is uh, res uh, getting as there is a resolution of the SRS because uh, the neurosensory retina regains contact with the RP. The second hypothesis is that there is reduction in the rhodopsin and uh, optical density resulting in a window defect with increased autofluorescence from the underlying relatively preserved RP. Also, we can uh, there are different uh, autofluorescence features in both regmatogenous and exudative RD, although both have presence of subretinal fluid. In regmatogenous RD, acute cases, we have hypo or iso autofluorescence with or without a posterior uh, hyper autofluorescence margin. Uh, whereas in exudative RD, acute cases, we have hypo, uh, hypo autofluorescence areas. In chronic regmatogenous retinal detachments, the, uh, uh, there is hypoautofluorescence with a demarcation line with or without a hyperautofluorescent uh, posterior margin. Whereas in exudative RD, uh, it is not hypo, but it is speckled hyperautofluorescence. The hypothesis behind this is that uh, in regmatogenous RD, there is an escape for the photoreceptor outer segments because of the flow induced by the ocular saccades and the convection currents. Whereas in an exudative RD, the fluid is in a loculated uh, space with no means of escape for the shed photoreceptor outer segments, causing increased metabolic activity of the RP, causing hyperautofluorescence. Uh, to conclude, what do we get from uh, autofluorescence imaging is that uh, we get to know the anatomical and the functional changes in the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, the hyper and the hypoautofluorescent patterns in areas immediately adjacent to the retinal detachment can firstly demarcate its extent, help explain visual prognosis also. To understand residual postoperative symptoms and counseling the patient regarding them, it is basically a non invasive tool to complement other imaging modalities and to understand the pathophysiology better. These are my acknowledgements. Thank you. Thanks, Priyanka. Uh, if anybody has uh, questions or uh, any additional points to make. Uh, Priyanka, this is an interesting uh, take on autofluorescence. Uh, can you just uh, tell us in which patients of RD would you be likely doing this autofluorescence? Mm, Ma'am, we can do it in chronic, uh, chronic retinal detachments to see uh, the uh, where is the hypoautofluorescence or the demarcation line. 
to the market the extent so that we can uh, explain the prognosis to the patients. In acute cases, most likely, man, we won't go for autofluorescence imaging. Demarcation yes. line is seen uh, with the fundus imaging uh, as well. So why would you like to do an autofluorescence uh, just for, just to see the demarcation? So we can explain that by when you see demarcation lines, not all are pigmented. Some of them are lightly pigmented and maybe covered by SRF and you might not know because it is just cross the SRF, it just cross the demarcation line. If there's actual RP atrophy because of the chronic uh, detachment, especially if it is involving the macula, you will see a very dark hypoautofluorescent areas, which clearly says that even if you reattach the retina and even if the retina goes back to its position at the fovea, the vision is not going to get better. Of course, you can do alternately in OCT and you can just show that uh, RP is uh, uh, atrophic. But when you have so much SRF, sometimes you are not able to, uh, the patient is not able to fix as well. So you won't get a good uh, OCT, right, going through the fovea. And uh, RP atrophy, clearly if there is a patch like what you see in a geographic atrophy, said, uh, for, uh, for such thing to be able to see properly, you need to have good fixation, be able to co-localize with what you have uh, the fovea. So that way, yes, in chronic RD, if you have this, uh, uh, just to prognosticate the visual prognosis, even if you have uh, going to do a good, uh, I mean, if you're going to get a good functional outcome, you know that, sorry, uh, surgical outcome, the functional outcomes might not be uh, great. The other thing that I found useful is that if you do an octose, and if you don't have these lashes in between, if you carefully remove the lashes, in many of the cases where chronic RD is, you are not able to see the peripheral uh, lesions very well say you may you may probably miss it sometimes not telling every, every time when the rd is shallow you might just pick up a break because there's a window defect at the area of the uh, atrophic hole in that lattice so some i do like to look at the auto process images where these uh, uh, lash artifacts are not there especially the inferior rds and the chronic rds where you can you can just look sometimes for that uh, uh, hyper autofluorescent window defect and that is only for shallow RD, not for the bullous retinal detachment. Okay, I think it would be uh, more useful in post-operative uh, patients where the macula is attached, but the patient still has, uh, say, poor vision. Maybe for unexplained, uh, you know, visual loss, it can help. Sometimes, uh, if it shows you some autofluorescence changes, maybe you can explain to the patient that this is the reason for uh, poor visual uh, uh, recovery. Then the problem. Is, sorry, ma'am. Uh, the problem is what we say is when we see those pockets of SRF, we are not sure that is actually uh, the hypo or the hyper due to the. So when we do an OCT, then we try to explain it. It goes the opposite way. So you do an OCT and then you try to explain the autofluorescence. The autofluorescence directly no, doesn't I, really I explain. Not, no, no, I am not talking about these fluids of uh, pockets. Ah, you are talking about atrophy. This is this is very common. You will see this SRF blebs after a successful reattachment yes. of retina. It is seen in yes, both buccal as well as vitrectomy and it is yes, actually yes. a self-limiting condition. It goes away without causing yes, any problem. Absolutely. I am talking about a patient say who has a macula on RD and who has undergone a successful surgery but has a poorer vision visual outcome post-operatively. Maybe in such situations if you do an autofluorescence it can give you some pointer as to why the visual recovery is uh, poor or, or it is less than uh, pre-operative. Yeah, Dr. MP, madam, you were saying something. Yeah, uh, nice presentation, Priyanka. And uh, this is something that uh, I think Priyanka herself has observed and uh, presented. So I think uh, congratulations. It's a well done uh, presentation. Uh, where I have found this autofluorescence useful, especially when you have uh, younger patients who are aphakic or pseudophakic who have nystagmus poorly dilating pupil and vision never better than 618, 636. And it's always assumed that that's as much as they can see. And you ask for an optos image, always ask for autofluorescence image. Find sometimes the shallow retinal detachments show up as areas of hyper autofluorescence and that can guide you to the presence of a retinal detachment. And as Dhanishree said, yes, uh, unexplained visual loss post-surgery and uh, if you're looking at the finer visual acuities of the patients who achieve 6 6 who are otherwise all right but uh, technically but who are unhappy with the vision have uh, anisoconia metamorphopsia the identification of retinal vessel printing which indicates that there is a subtle displacement of the retina from its original place 
is also an important finding that right now we are working on. So just thought we could share this. So thank you, Priyanka and everybody else for their uh, comments.